briefly before we go on to the Rolls Royce, what, what is what what is an SFO case? If you, you know, how well, would you characterise it? Um, I uh, you know, the website needed something to uh, a definition of an SFO case. When the SFO started, it was there was it was usually expressed in financial terms, you know, above a certain uh, value or whatever, which is pretty meaningless these days. So I tried to set out what I thought an SFO case by reference to the point of the SFO, which is, as I said, to do the most difficult stuff. And uh, I said, uh, I, I, I said that it was cases which undermine UK financial or commercial PLC in general, and the City of London in particular. And uh, if you bear that in mind, then you look at, say, some of the cases we've taken on, like Barclays Bank in relation to the Qatar recapitalization, uh, Rolls-Royce, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, um, there are many, we've got maybe 60 uh, active investigations at the moment, uh, some running for three, four years. So Rolls-Royce, um, yeah. they ended up paying £497 million, pounds, 250, £497 million, £252,645 pounds plus interest, plus your costs, plus money to the United States and to Brazil. Yes. It's still massive. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? Talk, how, does a, how does a case like Rolls Royce begin? The Rolls Royce case came about um, through a blog that um, appeared, I think it was in China, and then we spoke to Rolls Royce to ask them about it, and then they came back to us with um, very much more than what was out there. And it was quite clear from the start that this was a corporate that wanted to um, be open and cooperate with us fully. And as you say, it was a vast enterprise that we undertook. So Rolls-Royce, uh, I think some 55,000 employees, 50 countries um, around the world um, they have a presence in. And we had to look at that. And ultimately the DPA that you talked about. Deferred prosecution agreement. Deferred prosecution agreement. Um, yeah. Um, was um, an acknowledgement of bribery um, to foreign officials over three decades, I think seven jurisdictions, and as you say, it was vast in terms of the penalty figure, it was um, dwarfed anything that we'd seen before, and in terms of our investigation, um, given the scale of it, um, we had something like 40, up to 40 million now, it started at 30 million, but it's now 40 million unfiltered documents that Rolls-Royce handed over to us. I think I'm assuming you don't have people who read the, every comment on, on every story on the Guardian website. How does that get picked up? I mean, there's many different ways in which uh, we get intelligence material. We have whistleblowers, we have disgruntled competitors that come to us. We have, obviously, intelligence sharing with um, various different initiatives, not only our law enforcement agencies, but also there's our increasingly private uh, public sector initiatives in terms of intelligence sharing. And this was just one mechanism by which we came to find out about it. You were talking the other day about the robot. Yeah, so as I say, faced with 40 million documents, we had to think of um, ways of tackling that. And one way that we found was being creative, innovative, and we used a um, private sector company, an, an IT specialist, to work with us. So we created a bespoke artificial intelligence uh, robot that we have used to look at that unfiltered material. So, so the Deferred Prosecution Agreement, David, this is a relatively new tool yeah. um, by the standards of, of yeah. um, these things. Um, essentially what that means is you and the company come to an agreement that they did something wrong, that you were right in saying they did something wrong, and that's signed off by a judge. A DPA is a mechanism by which a company, not an individual, a company can account to a court in a transparent way for wrongdoing that it admits without incurring a criminal conviction. I mean, there was some criticism of the Rolls-Royce DPA because it was felt that since Rolls-Royce hadn't self-reported, yeah. um, they shouldn't have been allowed to have a DPA. Yeah. Um, but you were saying they had in fact cooperated. What yeah. does cooperation look like? So, I mean, as David was saying, cooperation is, is real cooperation, so it's not saying to us, yeah, yeah, we're going to help you, but actually sitting on the fence, keeping back um, material that we want to see. 
Um, and so cooperation means coming to us really with that in mind. So it means handing over the documents as well as Royce did. It means highlighting to us what the findings they've had. It means um, showing us that they're serious. So it means getting rid of the senior executives on the board that oversaw the, the conduct that, that were there in place at the time. It means a complete overhaul of your compliance program and demonstration that you have uh, real risk controls in place. And, I mean, there have been now four yeah. DPAs, right? Is this, to what extent is that, is that sort of a, the key factor in this well, good run of cases that the SFO has been having? Well, it's a, it's a new statutory tool that we have been given and we have made good use of it. There are clearly hundreds and thousands of fraud cases. With the biggest and, and most complex. deal with the biggest and most complex ones. Yeah. In that case, how do you measure success? Well, what I think is neither here nor there, so don't take it from me. Take it from the OECD in Paris, who published a report uh, in the spring of this year, uh, saying that the work of the SFO um, had basically led the UK response to overseas commercial bribery and that without the effort of the SFO, it wouldn't have happened. Do you feel that lower tier fraud, if you're the upper tier fraud, is therefore is it were under police? Yes, I do. I think what's happened since probably 1990 is that the traditional fraud squads attached to police forces up and down the country have tended to rather wither on the vine as other priorities have, have come forward. Um, and it may well be time to concentrate more resource on that area. Um, when I said, how do you measure success? The amount of money that you bring through the door. Um, yeah, I thought it was a bit vulgar. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 let me do it for you. Um, uh, between two, 2014 and 2016, you, your outlay was £216 million, pounds, and your income, if that's the way one can put it, um, <laughs> is. It's, I'm putting it like that, I'm not expecting you to, is £676 million. Pounds. Um, I mean, that's a pretty decent profit for, for the Treasury, right? I mean, they must be quite sharp. Yeah, I haven't heard them complain, but um, <laughs> I, I think it's very important. Look, what we're doing uh, through DPAs and what we do through confiscation is simply we make use, good use, of sound statutory tools which are available to us. Uh, of course, it's a measure of success, if you like, how, how much we bring in. But uh, at the end of the day, it's not, you don't really want to mix profit incentive with prosecutors. That's never a very good mix. Because what happens is, uh, in theory, at least, and certainly in public perception, um, a prosecutor's judgment can be skewed towards catch-rich cases, and that can never be a good thing.